What's going on all of my healthcare brothers and sisters? I hope that you are having a wonderful day. If you're watching this video, then you're continuing on in the ATIT's version seven reading portion. And today we're gonna to be talking about craft and structure. Let's get started. So for the craft and structure portion of the exam, there's gonna be a total of nine questions out of the total 39. And that is going to cover distinguishing between facts and opinions to identify misconceptions and biases, interpreting the meaning of words and phrases using context, and evaluating the author's purpose in a given text. Let's break each one of these down. So to begin, we're gonna take a closer look at distinguishing between fact and opinion to identify misconceptions and biases. And the first subtopic underneath this main topic is recognizing factual writing supported by evidence. So when information is presented as factual in a text, the reader must be able to trust that the information is accurate and trustworthy. To determine whether a statement is a fact or opinion, we have to look for cues within the text. We have to ask ourselves, is the author citing specific evidence to support this claim? Are they using language that indicates they are sharing their own opinion? Are there citations supporting the facts? So for example, Let's say you come across the following sentence in a passage. The sun is the largest star in the solar system. Okay, we know that this is a fact. We know that this is true because it is supported by scientific evidence. Now let's say you come across the following sentence. I think the sun is the most beautiful star in the solar system. Hmm. This is more of an opinion, right? The author is sharing their own thoughts on the matter by using the word, I think. When you're reading a text, it's important to be able to identify these differences. This will help you understand the author's point of view, and it'll also help you spot out any misconceptions or biases. There are various types of sources, for example, in texts that show evidence of fact, including print and electronic sources, personal interviews, and observations. Credible sources are those that come from reliable authors and contain accurate information. The source should be up to date. Let's take a look at identifying an author's point of view and viewpoint. So an author's point of view is their perspective or opinion on a particular issue. This can be expressed directly or it can be implied through language and through tone of text. For example, an author might use first person point of view to express their own opinions on a topic. You're going to be able to identify these by the use of words such as I, me, and we pronouns. They may also use third person point of view to discuss somebody else's opinions or to present objective information. These can be identified with words such as he, she, and they pronouns. The key is to be able to identify the author's point of view so that you can understand what the argument really is. The author's viewpoint is similar to point of view, but it refers to the biases that an author may have. They can be based on their personal experiences, their cultural background, or their political beliefs. It's important to be able to identify these biases so that you understand the author's argument and can critically evaluate the information that they are presenting. Moving on, we're gonna be looking at author's tone and biases. To begin, the tone of a text is the overall attitude that the author has towards a particular subject matter. This can be positive, negative, or neutral. The ATIT's tests may also use words such as joyful, detached, and ominous. To determine the tone, it may be best to consider the event or context or even circumstances behind that particular text. So for example, an author might have a positive tone towards the subject of education, <laughs> like me, right? This can be identified through the use of positive words and phrases, such as learning opportunities and the importance of education. On the other hand, the author might have a negative tone towards a subject of education. This can be identified through the use of negative words or phrases, such as the burden of homework or the pressure of standardized tests. I think we're all feeling that right now, right? With the ATITs. The key is to be able to identify the author's tone so that you can better understand their particular argument. 
So author bias, when an author shows a preference towards one thing or another, they're using bias, right? This can be based on their personal experiences, their cultural background, or really their political beliefs. So for example, an author might be biased towards the subject of education. Because they believe that this is the key to success, this can be identified through the words of phrases such as education is the key to success and a good education is essential. That is the author's positive bias on education, right? But on the other hand, the author might not be biased towards a subject because they believe that it is a waste of time. This can be identified through the words, uh, the use of words and phrases such as education is a complete waste of time and you don't need education to be successful. It's really important that we're able to detect the difference between a bias and a stereotype. And it's truly important that you're able to distinguish between the two when you're taking the ATITs. So when it comes to biases, as we discussed before, it is the author's use of showing a preference for one thing over another. Whereas with stereotypes, this is the oversimplification of a group of people that are based on preconceived notions. So for example, an author might be biased towards the subject of education because they believe that it is truly the key to success. On the other hand, an author might stereotype people who are educated as being snobby and arrogant. How can readers detect the difference between stereotypes and biases in text? One way to do this is to consider the language that the author is using. So for example, Biased language might include words and phrases such as should, must, and everyone. Whereas stereotypical language might include words and phrases such as all, every, and never. Another way to detect bias and stereotypes is to consider the author's point of view. If the author is presenting their argument from a personal perspective, then they might be actually presenting something that is biased. If the author is presenting their argument from a neutral perspective, then they are less likely to be experiencing bias. Our next topic is distinguishing between fact and opinion. This one tends to get people a little confused sometimes, so let's break it down. A fact is a statement that can be proven to be true. There is a reliable and credible evidence that supports a fact. An opinion is a statement that reflects the author's beliefs, values or feelings. So for example, the statement education is the key to success is truly an opinion. Whereas the statement a good education is essential is a fact. To determine whether a statement is a fact or opinion, you can ask yourself one of two questions. Can the statement be proven to be true? Does the statement reflect the author's beliefs, values or feelings? If you answer yes to the first question, then the statement is a fact. It may, it has to be supported by credible or reliable evidence in order for it to be considered a fact. If you answered yes to the second question, the statement is an opinion. Opinions may mislead or persuade a reader depending on what's happening within the context. Let's move on to interpreting the meaning of words and phrases using context, more specifically context clues. While you encounter an unfamiliar word, you can use context to determine what the meaning of that particular word is. Context clues are words or phrases that surround an unfamiliar word and provide information about its specific meaning. So on the ATITs, you are going to come across four different types of context clues. Number one is definition. The author directly defines the word or phrase. So for example, the word bias is defined as a preference for one thing over another. Number two is restatement. The author restates a word or phrase using different language. So for example, carnivores, that is meat eaters, are at the top of the food chain, right? Carnivores are meat eaters. That is restatement. Number three is contrast. The author provides an opposite of the word or phrase. So for example, while Carlos is hardworking, his indolent sister spends more time watching television than working. Do you see the contrast there? 
Carlos is hardworking, and it sounds like his sister is not so much. And then lastly, number four, inference. The author provides information that can be inferred from the word or phrase. So for example, Jennifer's belligerence surprised everyone. She threw her phone across the room and pushed through the door. See, see how that kind of gets inferred there? Belligerence sounds like angry. It sounds like she's upset. It's, it's unlike her per this particular statement in this particular passage. Hopefully these four context clues made it a little bit easier for you to find the definition of specific words. So the use of specific words can have an effect on a text, right? The author's choice of words can have a significant effect on the meaning of the overall passage. The author's tone, that's the author's feeling towards that text, can affect the mood, the reader's feeling toward the text. So for example, the word success can be both, both positive as well as negative. The definition of the word success is the achievement of something desired, planned, or attempted, right? That has a very specific, positive undertone within a text. The word essential also has a positive undertone, while the word good really could come across more as a neutral kind of choice. The word key has a positive connotation, while the word prerequisite has a negative connotation, right? You had to do a whole bunch of prerequisites before you could actually get into your nursing program. That could come across as a little negative. While you are reading, it's important to be aware of the effect that these words have on a specific meaning of text when you're taking your T's test. Next, let's move on to one of my favorite topics on the ATITs, and that is figurative language. So figurative language is language that is not meant to be taken literally, right? Figurative language can be used to make a point more clearly, to make a comparison, or to add interest to a text. So four different types of figurative language that you might see on the test is simile, metaphor, personification, and hyperbole. So let's begin with simile. A simile is a figure of speech that uses words like or as to make a comparison. So for example, she's as busy as a bee. See how that word as is being used in the middle? She's, her being busy as a bee, we know bees are extremely hardworking, is a simile. They are comparing each other. She's busy, that bee's also busy. A metaphor is a figure of speech that uses one thing to represent another. For example, she's a fireball. She's not literally a fireball, but if you had to compare her to something, she's a fireball. <laughs> Personification is a figure of speech that gives human characteristics to non-human objects. So for example, the wind was howling, right? We're giving a human characteristic to a non-human object. Our non-human object is the wind and that howling is a human characteristic. That is what's being compared here. And then lastly, hyperbole is a figure of speech that uses exaggeration to make a point. So for example, I'm so hungry, I could eat a horse. I don't literally want to eat a horse, but I'm so hungry that if that was my only option, that's probably what I would end up eating, right? If, no, if, if you didn't know, I'm a vegetarian, so there's no horse eating over here. <laughs> no meat at all, thanks. Uh, as you're reading, be on the lookout for figurative language. When you come across a figure of speech, try to determine what the author is trying to communicate to you in order to understand what's happening within the text. So moving on to the next main topic, evaluating the author's purpose in a given text. And we begin by determining and drawing inferences about the author's purpose. So the author's purpose is the reason why that particular author is writing this particular text. The author's purpose can be to inform, entertain, describe, explain, or persuade. In order to determine what the author's purpose is, you need to look at the text as a whole and consider the following. What is the topic of the text? Who is the audience? What's the overall tone? What word choices is the author using? Is there figurative language that's being used? And what is the overall organization? 
Once you have considered all of these particular topics, you should be able to identify specifically what the author's purpose is. So continuing on with determining the inferences about an author's purpose, there are five different kinds of writing styles that we truly have to take into account when we're trying to determine purpose. Number one is informative writing. So informative writing is to inform the reader about a topic. When you're reading informational texts, look for facts and details that support this particular author's claim. The author should be unbiased and present both sides of an argument if there really is one. The next kind of writing style you might see is persuasive writing. And the purpose of persuasive writing is to persuade the reader to do something or to believe something. When you are reading persuasive text, look for the author's point of view, right? The author should be biased and present only one side of an argument in order for it to be considered persuasive. The author will use a variety of techniques to help you persuade your mind into thinking about what they want you to think about. These techniques can include log logical reasoning, emotional appeal, use of facts and statistics, testimonials, as well as some kind of expert opinion. Number three is entertainment, entertaining writing, right? The purpose of entertaining writing is to entertain that reader. When you're reading entertaining texts, you look for the author's use of humor, irony, and sarcasm. The author may also use a variety of literary devices to add interest to the text, such as plot, setting, characterization, conflict, as well as themes. So number four is descriptive writing. The purpose of descriptive writing is to describe a person, place, thing, or an event. When you're reading descriptive text, look for the author's use of sensory details or going to try to use your senses with descriptive writing. The author is going to use vivid language to create a mental image for the reader by describing what that person, that thing, that place, or that event is. And then lastly, number five is expiratory writing. The purpose of expiratory writing is to explain a concept, steps within a process, or an idea. When you're reading expiratory text, look for the author's use of definitions, examples, and even non-examples. The author should present the information as clear and concisely as possible. I hope that the following information was helpful in understanding reading, craft, and structure on the ATITs. If you have any additional questions, make sure that you leave them down below. I love answering your questions. Head over to nursechung.com where there's additional resources for you to help you pass your ATITs test. And as always, I will see you in the next video. Bye!